Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining up and glad to see that uh, we're, our reach is expanding. It's awesome. And I know uh, I saw people joining up. Our speaker here is from Atlanta, Georgia. And, and uh, so I happen to see a lot of people signing up from uh, Atlanta. So welcome. And then uh, yeah, Seattle, Canada, Pensacola, Florida. That's uh, I'd rather be down there on the beach. Uh, <laughs> Michigan. So yeah, Kansas. Thanks for everybody for coming and uh, joining us. So let me uh, make sure I've got all my stuff set up. I think I do. I have my adult beverage of choice uh, with me here. So hopefully uh, that's all good. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'll introduce myself. My, I'm Paul Baylog, uh, Java Ducky on there on Twitter. Um, I am a uh, cloud platform team lead for my company. Uh, it's well, not my company, but NISC, we're a uh, software cooperative. Uh, also, the other members of the steering committee are Sabri Blackman, um, and he may be joining us today. Uh, I'm sure he'll probably be popping on soon. Uh, Brandon Hunter and Cesar John. Oh, he's here. Okay. I'll get him invited here to the screen in just a sec. Probably just so you can see him and wave and all that good stuff, but uh, he won't be presenting tonight. Um we gave him the day off. <laughs> He's usually uh, hooking us up with uh, good info. So if we continue on, I just would like to thank our sponsors. Uh, we've got GoBridge, which is covering all the meetup fees, uh, the CNCF, because this is a talk about GRPC this uh, this evening. Um, they're co-sponsoring, um, so covering the, uh, the Crowdcast fees. Um, and as such, because given all the everything that's going on and everything we figured we better uh, make a note of the code of conduct from both of these uh you know that will be covered under that everybody's been pretty good and gracious and everything so we've never had any issues but figured we'd just go ahead and um so now just wanted to open up now it's kind of difficult in these uh virtual meetups but uh is there any kind of questions that people want to get answered or anything that's uh I don't know that they want to advertise a cool project that they're working on or uh, just need any kind of advice. Now's the opportunity. Otherwise, uh, we'll go ahead and skip along <laughs> and feel free to put any kind of questions that you have down there in the bottom. There should be a uh, ask a question uh, section there that you should all see. And then I'll be, uh, I'll try to throw out some polls there as we're going along as well. All right, so we've got one project out there. So yeah, we'll have to. I'll definitely have to check that out. Okay. All right. So um, we'll move on. <clears throat> so coming up, uh, it was rescheduled, but uh, the GopherCon. I'm. Uh, I wish I could say that I would be going to this one. I'll be going to a uh, uh, follow up one, but uh, but yeah, it, this is still going on. Um, They've rescheduled, so hopefully everything goes well and then uh, they can actually hold it. So look forward to hearing about talks from that one. And then uh, KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, this is one that I plan on actually going to in Boston um, as long as it happens and everything's all good. I don't want to get sick. So that'll be in uh, late November. So hopefully uh, if any of you are going to that, you can uh, hit me up. So with that, the housekeeping is done, and I can. I'd just like to introduce John Corey, our next speaker. He's he uh, he's coming to us from the Atlanta uh, GoLang Meetup group. So thank you. So welcome, John. Hey, thanks, Paul. How how's the audio? Can can you hear me? I do. It's okay. Uh, it's kind of weird. I don't hear myself in the uh, in my earphones. In but, the studio. Um, yeah. <laughs> So let's see. I um, how do I? Uh, I don't know how to make it. How to share the um, the slides tab? How do I do that? There we go. Oh, there it is. There's my. Yeah, you should have a share. Yeah. All right. Good. So. Um, okay. So this is a little weird. Uh, getting used to giving these presentations and talking in the age of coronavirus where you don't have people in front of you and you get zero feedback at all. It's just a really strange experience. Um, 
I'll do my best with that. It's it's a lot nicer to have like faces to look at and some kind of like uh, you know chuckles or people throwing stuff at you to kind of let you know that uh, they're listening to you. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm John, and uh, my talk is titled "GRPC and Protobuf: High Performance APIs, High Performance Development Teams," and um, and I'd like to really accentuate that that like that. Not only are we seeking to improve the performance of our APIs, but um, but I really feel strongly that we have technology here that will allow us to increase the performance of our engineering teams and departments. And um, I hope that uh, I hope that I make that case in this talk. Um, this is pretty introductory level stuff. If you're a, a seasoned uh, gRPC user and have built gRPC services, you probably won't find anything new here, um, or not much anyway. Um, this is uh, more of an intro. I um, My best like way of learning is to get a high level introduction to something by someone who knows a little about it, and then go off by myself and spend some time experimenting and researching and um, you know, banging my head against my desk and uh, figuring it out kind of uh, kind of on my own. And, and what I hope to do tonight is to plant some seeds amongst you to send you off to do that, to do that process yourself and kind of um, uh, take this opportunity to get enough of an introduction to want to go learn more and do some research and kind of dig into this and, and see if you can even like, um, you know, build a service this way. Uh, instead of the RESTful JSON way that we're also used to. Um, so I'm John Corey. I'm the lead backend engineer at a startup here in Atlanta called Monstro. We're a, a wealth management um, startup. Uh, there's my, my contact info of varying sorts is all there on this slide. Um, I guess this slide will be um, available somehow like for download or whatever after this is all over. Uh, I absolutely welcome you to to reach out by whatever means you want to get in touch ask questions if there's any way that i can help or support or um share anything that i know um that's like my favorite thing to do so do, do not hesitate to ask um and that's my dog champ and i sit in there so um so what we're like really talking about here is computers talking to each other i mean that's basically like what all of this is about, um, APIs in general, that's, that's all it is, uh, sharing information across a network. Um, so we'll take a, a very shallow look at a very deep subject. It's kind of fun, the, the long history of this. Um, but uh, across generations of computer scientists and then later like you know programmers or engineers or whatever we are, uh, the goal of language and operating system agnostic communication has been uh, desirable, you know, and that was a very early goal that was that was um, decided, you know, uh, in the mother of all demos by Doug Engelbart. I don't know if you know about. Oh wait, gosh, I've got Keynote in one window and um, and the slides here in another, so uh, they're not advancing in sync. Um, I don't know if you know about Doug. Engelbart and the mother of all demos in San Francisco in October of 1968. If you don't uh, read about that, it's some very fantastic, exciting, interesting stuff about like kind of the advent of computers as a thing that people would actually care about. Uh, but there, like a uh, transfer of data from one computer to another um, across to, from Stanford to the downtown conference center was like a huge uh, a huge part of that demo and a huge like uh, goal of all of that and and kind of a precursor to the internet as we would come to know it. Um, and that was very early. I was in 1968. So 1970 brings us um, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie working on Unix at Bell Labs, uh, networking and sharing data between computers, all very important to that effort. Uh, Bob Metcalf builds a 100 kilobit per second network interface uh, between MIT and uh, a different institution. There was a different organization. This is the beginning of ARPANET. Um, 
Nodes are being added then at the rate of about one per month. By 1973, 30 institutions, mainly universities, are connected to ARPANET. Unix incorporates TCP IP. You know, networking is a thing. Uh, let's see, what is it? 1982, Times Person of the Year is the personal computer. DNS is invented. The Mac is introduced. Uh, HTML is proposed. Early 80s. I was, I was nine years old. Uh, so then like, um, I don't know, I got a computer and got connected to the internet. Probably I had some early bulletin board experiences with the like, you know, 1800 baud modem or whatever, um, early, early on, but then got connected to the internet and probably like the late nineties and, um, and fell right in and just like loved it. And, and my first question was like, how do they how do they do this? How do they make this stuff? And so I started reading about how to build things for the web. Um, and that was kind of how I got my start in this career. Uh, you we read books back then um, to learn how to do this. There was no stack overflow um, and not really a Google yet either. And, and to learn, you read books and they looked like this. They came with CDs on the back, but this is like an early one. Client server programming with Java and Corva. <laughs> so, oh. uh, yeah, you remember, Paul. <laughs> um, yes, I do. <laughs> and then uh, and then this gave way to uh, Java, XML, and web services. And, you know, there was this season of the, uh, the right, immediate post.com boom where the entire world was – enamored with sharing data structures across the internet and absolutely convinced that XML and SOAP would just revolutionize the entire world. Uh, we were so enamored with this idea that we entirely overlooked the how much XML just totally sucks to work with um, and work with it we did. And then uh, JavaScript took over and we got JSON. JSON became the standard. And uh, this should be familiar to everybody. JSON is a huge improvement over XML, much easier to work with. It's kind of like self-labeled, um, much easier to read, easier to handle nesting of things. It has semantics. Uh, serialization and deserialization is fairly easy because of this. Um, very widely supported. Every Everyone knows it. It's like the first thing you learn when you start writing JavaScript. Far less verbose than XML. It's it's a lot less bytes over the wire to convey the same amount of information. Um, and like, you know, so far, uh, this is the best we've come up with for very for generic system sharing data back and forth. I'd imagine that many of you in attendance are probably making your like living day to day writing services that uh, that send uh, and consume JSON. Uh, you know, in, in one form or another. Maybe you're writing uh, Go APIs that uh, that publish JSON to URLs that are consumed by some web or native mobile client, and those platforms um, ingest that JSON and use it to populate views. Um, that's a very common use case that we're all very familiar with. Um, and then the other one, of course, is like, uh, publishing data back and forth service to service where we have like a microservices architecture or, or similar. And, um, you know, I've got to publish a message that will be picked up by some consumer. And so typically it's JSON that we're doing. And, and here with Go, we'll take that JSON and use the data in the JSON to uh, marshal the JSON into uh, internal data types, you know, Go structs, and then use those types to do things in our programs, and then output some some output there where we where we serialize um, whatever our uh, internal data type is to some JSON to pass it on to the next thing. But we're sending JSON around data centers back and forth from service to service and from service to client, um, and that's been that's been pretty much the standard since um, oh I don't know since at least like the last. 10 or 15 years anyway. I think it was like 15 years ago, I was writing XML and then all of a sudden we started doing Ajax um, and it was like, then jQuery came out and everybody knows JavaScript all of a sudden. And so JSON becomes like kind of the way and 
And that's what we've been doing since then. Um, in 2016, I was on a team where we got this new VP of engineering who announced we're gonna, we'll, we'll use gRPC and protobufs. And I had never heard of that at all. It was, might have well have been in Chinese. Uh, no idea what he's talking about. I've never even like, never even heard of this. Um, and so we did start doing that. And that was when I got my initial experience with that. And it is a departure from this. And uh, I told you in the introductory that one of the things that I hope to do is make the case that we are building not only higher performing APIs this way, but we're building higher performing teams this way. And so I kind of want to get into like what I mean by that and like where the, where the, where the potential for that is. Uh, so here is one of my, one of the good slides here in the talk, these next three slides. So RESTful APIs uh, depend heavily on communication and words and human readable language and intent. Um, so what do I mean by that? It's like this, this all depends on a very strict agreement between the API developer and the, uh, and, and the consumer. Um, there's a contract and it's a very kind of, it's a strict agreement, but it's, it's loosely enforced, which is like a bad combo. Uh, like it, it is only going to work one way, but, um, but it's, we don't know what that way is. I'm like just throwing data at a, at a service, hoping that it will work, you know? And this is all like communicated and codified or whatever and described by human written, human readable things that tend to be unreliable, you know, documentation, uh, swagger, swagger docs is a way that we do that. Um, and then if those are incomplete or inaccurate, which in my experience, they often are, they're supplemented by emails or standing at each other's desks asking questions uh, or Slack messages or something like that. And like now you and I are like chatting, the consumer and the producer of the API, like back end engineer is talking to front engineer about like what is expected in a request and what they can respect in turn in a response. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of very fragile communication that goes on around uh, RESTful APIs. Um, this is problematic and it makes it difficult and kind of brittle. Um, there's another, another component of this though, is that like um, there's, there's the same kind of communication breakdown between the computers. There's lots of uh, marshalling and unmarshalling and serializing and deserializing and like converting and just like tons of like type conversions that are happening with every request response cycle um, that pile up and tend to get kind of inefficient. We'll look a little more at closely at that later. Um, but there are some inefficiencies in this system. So uh, here in our slide, you know, we kind of see the workflow, you know, like one, one developer is going to need some info and, and the other one's like, okay, well, I can give you info. No problem. How are you going to ask for it? Well, I'll tell you. Okay, great. Nope. Uh, we, I think we're on the same page here. And so let's come back uh, after like at the end of the sprint, when the API endpoints that are being discussed on this slide have been built. And it looks something like this. Um, yeah, it's like this. It's like, okay, here's what we said, right? Well, no, you get a 400 bad request. Well, why? Oh, I don't know. Let me see. Why, why do you? Oh, because, you know, I thought you were going to send me the user ID. You put it in the URL. And there's like all these different ways of doing this, but, but it's very, um, dependent on uh, kind of heavy documentation and very specific communication about how it works. Um, so this slide uh, has happened to me in my life as a developer over and over and over again. I can't tell you how many times. And it's just basically like the cycle of a development sprint. Um, so we write Swagger docs and we write request validation and we send back um, descriptive error messages and error bags where, where each request parameter has its own validation error. And this is a tremendous amount of work to do all of this and get it right, but it's what we do because it's responsible and, and communicative. Um, 
and and it's what's necessary for keeping my client and my server or my server and the other services consuming it in sync with each other as as requirements are changing and development is happening okay uh, so then there's a lot of work that's done that's just that's just taking place around formatting and parsing and and turning json into actionable types in my program and turning the data in my program into json that can be um, sent back and forth um, and this introduces a lot of confusion too like what's what's going to be the shape of that data so these are some of the problems with the way that we have been doing this up to now um, i i don't know can i if i can uh if i can i'm going to leave that slide and come right over here to the uh to the chat but um if you are aware of or can think of or have experienced other problems in addition to the ones that I have like named here, I would love to hear about it. You can type that in the chat. And I'll, I'll take a look at it here in just a few minutes. Um, so what are we gonna do about all of this? So let's enter gRPC. This is, this is an alternative to the restful uh, paradigm that we have been kind of following, do, doing things under for uh, for a while. So what is this? Um, gRPC has has kind of a kind of a dumb like name. It stands for gRPC remote procedure calls. So that's kind of recursive naming. I don't someone thought that was clever, I guess. Um, it is a modern open source standards based high performance general purpose feature rich RPC framework. Um, RPC stands for remote procedure calls. Uh, this is a property of the Cloud Native Computer Foundation. Um, it has an FAQ. Uh, there's some great documentation around this. Uh, if you're if you're going to like dig into this and learn, gRPC.io is a great great resource. And the little getting started guide and how to begin is is very uh, it's very well documented and well described. And it's it's very easy to do like the first. Uh, most easy thing with gRPC for sure. Uh, this goes hand in hand with Go. It is the Go tooling around. It's very well supported with Go, uh, in Go. Um, we get from this some very modern tools for easily building extremely low latency distributed systems. Um, this is under continuous benchmarks to ensure that we have no performance regressions from version to version, like each, each version release is faster than the one uh, that came before. Um, it's a framework for building remote procedure calls uh, and consuming those. Uh, the transport layer is HTTP2. And so you get some efficiencies right there. Like most of our um, most of our RESTful services are built on HTTP one point something and, and uh, gRPC services are natively built on HTTP2, which you immediately realize some efficiencies just in the transport layer, like all, all other things being equal, um, the binary binary protocol, binary uh, encoding is, is extremely um, performant. Uh, works very well with our protobuf, protobuf serialization. We get multiplexing, we get duplex streaming, uh, simultaneous reads and writes. You don't have to wait uh, after sending a request to get a response back to do anything else. You can do all of these things async and simultaneously and, and gain a tremendous performance advantage just from that. Um, as I talk about some of these things, recognize that the sum of the gains from HTTP2, gRPC, and protobufs is greater than each of the individual parts for sure. So what then is a protobuf? Like you have heard me say that a number of times. Um, so this is a little weird because it's some different things, but it's it's a language agnostic platform, uh, a language and platform agnostic extensible mechanism for the binary serialization of structured data. So in a nutshell, you can think of that as very concise, tightly packed binary JSON is, is kind of what that is. It is not necessarily compressed for that, but just like the native format itself is um, is yields binary serialization of your uh, described data types. 
Um, it's also an IDL, an interface definition language, which maybe arguably JSON is too. Um, but uh, we'll take a look at we'll take a look at a sample of a proto file here in a little bit to see what I mean by that. But it's a a language in which I can describe structured data types. Um, and then it is a tool for the binary serialization of that structured data for transport over the wire. Um, so protobufs are written in their own language. So there are some huge advantages to this over JSON that we have been working with. Uh, one is the transport layer is transporting smaller packets, smaller bytes, smaller collections of bytes over the wire to convey the same amount of data. Um, uh, uh, structured data that is described as JSON and sent as ASCII text bytes is much larger than uh, comparable data that is described in as a protobuf and then serialized as binary data for transmission over the wire. It's, it's, a, it's an enormously smaller thing. So our, our requests and response bodies are much smaller this way than they are with RESTful services. Um, it's language agnostic, um, I guess similar to, to JSON. I mean, that's like definitely something that we would have to have where my Python client can readily consume my Go servers, um, you know, uh, uh, responses. Uh, let's see, there's language specific tooling available to handle the code generation that is necessary to build native types from your proto definitions. Um, we'll look at that in just a minute. There's very, very easy language interoperability. Um, some more than others, uh, Go is extremely well supported. Java is really well supported and well documented. Um, but there are like, um, there are generators and tooling for like all of the very common, um, platforms that we use. I don't, I don't, I, there's probably some things that are unrepresented, but there's, I've seen everything from like Swift to PHP, to JavaScript, to Python, to Go, to Java, um, .NET, of course, like, uh, you know, all of these things like have uh, protobuf tooling around them. And it's very easy to generate the, the code that you need to interface with this stuff. Um, if you're, if you're writing Go though, and I guess you are, if you're here, uh, you'll have a much easier time of it than I think some other platforms will give you. Um, you get more data types than you have with JSON, uh, like enums are a native uh, proto thing. Um, but not only are you describing data types, you're also describing services. Um, you get way faster encoding and decoding than in JSON, which is enormously uh, important. Uh, your service winds up spending a lot less uh, CPU time encoding, encoding responses than, um, than with a JSON service. Uh, you have a lot less boilerplate code. Uh, translations and formatting just doesn't happen as, as much. It's a lot smaller and more concise. Um, there's validation libraries and other extensions that you can add onto uh, your proto tool chain so that you're generating code that you would normally be writing, uh, which is very you know, kind of interesting. Um, so let's see, what, what are some metrics around that? Uh, I, don't have a, I don't have a Go example of this, but Auth0 used, um, did a, this Auth0 article is really, really good. This, they talk about their kind of transition to uh, protobufs, gRPC, and looked at performance gains and where they can get performance gains. And this is just, um, I think, what are we talking about here? I think in this diagram, we are talking about a common type expressed either as JSON or as a protobuf um, for sending over the wire and here, here is the comparison, right? Like JSON is orange and the protobuf is green. Um, this is in milliseconds. I'd have to look at the URL to go to remember like exactly what 
this i don't i hate when like someone shows me a chart but doesn't tell me like exactly what the data is and but i'm about to do exactly that like i'm not telling you exactly what the data is i don't i don't quite remember um it's available in this article though that they wrote this is one of the one of the really good uh hands-on we've been using this and studying some things and want to write about our experience articles that i have read about um comparing performance so this does not use Go services. This is doing it in Java, but um, but both cases were done in Java. And I think you're I think we would probably have better performance, but we probably have better performance with the JSON and with the with the uh, the proto buff. Um, but the relative performance gains would be very similar. If you're doing server to server communications in particular, uh, this is incredibly faster than than JSON is uh marshalling and, and transmission uh i've got another chart here that is all about uh this is all go and this is nanoseconds per operations with decoding and encoding uh three different things purple is json red is json stream and the orange is protobuf and this is in go and we're enormously more efficient um, simply encoding and, and decoding protobufs than we are with JSON. So there, here's another, like, this is another place that you pick up some efficiencies and in, in a performance gain. Um, it's a, a huge optimization. Um, but this doesn't get into teams, though. I, we talked a lot about the teams. We looked at the slide with our two superheroes kind of comparing APIs with one another and, like, two sprints in, they're still not on the same page about what's going to be produced and what's going to be delivered and what's going to be consumed. Um, let's look at next slide to see an example. Okay, here we go. Um, so this is a proto file. It's a very simple one. And this describes a greeter service that's that has a RPC called say hello. And the say hello RPC will send a greeting. And so it takes as its one parameter a hello request, and it returns a hello reply. And this, um, this line with the, that starts with the RPC in that service is a complete uh, definition of the services that, of that RPC. This is, this is complete um, as, as a proto. There are things that can be added to it, but right now in, it, in its entirety, this is like, this is complete just as it is. Uh, and it describes an interface. Uh, a say hello function will accept a hello request and it will return a hello reply. A hello request is defined below that. Um, it has one property. Its property is a string named name. All right, and then hello reply similarly has one property. Its property is of, of type string. It's name with a name of message. Uh, the little number is just a way that Proto kind of indexes the fields in a message. A message is uh, synonymous with a type. But uh, this simple little thing is a, a complete um, interface for a greeter service with a say hello uh, function. So how, how this helps me is this is this is the method by which I write the service and write the client for the service. Um, I can run a command, a fairly simple command. Let's see, I think uh, let me I think I've got it on a yeah there it is. With with this command from my terminal, I can generate um, the Go code that I need to build a to build a version of this service or build build out the Go file that describes this interface. And there are some stubs in there. I'll need to implement the stubs, and there's a little bit of work that I'll have to do to like to make this work, of course. Um, but basically, I'm just writing the types and functions that conform to this interface in my Go code and then plugging it into a gRPC server. Uh, and then my generated code includes a fully formed client for interfacing with that 
code that is an implementation of the interface. So I get I, I get a generated client in Go. I can I can generate that client in other languages if I want to. Uh, and that client is basically just a Go uh, package that has all of the functions and types needed for interfacing with the service. So, so how does this translate into a higher performing team is that I'm no longer bound by Swagger documentation. Um, if, if this proto file is in my repo where it's available to other people on the team, this file is all anyone needs to know how to interface with my service and how to make requests to it. Um, and then if if you don't want to read this file, hey, that's fine too. You don't even have to you don't even have to read this file to know how to do it. You can just uh, type the command below, generate a client, and then import it into your project. And you don't even have to read the file. You can just use GoLand or VS Code or whatever to inspect the type, and and you know your editor will tell you everything that you need to know about um about the service. You know, I mean, you can just like fill in the blanks with autocomplete. Uh, very, very easy. Uh, you get like, um, you know, type definitions and, and insights in your editor, uh, just as you do, I mean, with a Go struct or package, because that's all it is. It's, it is a Go uh, package containing structs that is generated from all of this. Um, I've, I made a note on my uh, presentation slide that says I could give you a whole talk on the tooling. It would be kind of a bitch to prepare but there's an entire talk's worth of material on just the tooling around this. Um, and it's, there's a lot to a lot to learn about that and some some real cool stuff that's being done. Um, so this service comes from and the example um, here at this URL. Um, usually I show the slide to a room full of people, so I put a QR code on it. Uh, this is this is worth going to take a look at if you're if you're interested in this stuff. Um, it's, it is fully fledged and very easy to digest and understand. Um, so uh, Bill Kennedy frequently says that, that type is life. And in, in talking about how we write programs, talks like, uh, you know, over and over again about how uh, type is really everything that we do and that, that Go is not a an object-oriented language, it is a data-oriented language, and that we're writing data-oriented services. And this, this has been drilled into me by him. Um, we're Go developers. If you're, if you're here and if you're a Go enthusiast as I am, uh, you're probably really enamored with and like really love our strong static, static type system, um, the performance, the, the, the compiler security that we get from that and just the certainty of that we know what data types we're passing around and, and there's no um, loose definitions anywhere. Everything's really tidy and type is really everything. Um, so what one of the advantages that we get from this is that we're able to, to preserve that very strict uh, static type system for transmission for for service to service um, publishing and consumption, we don't we don't have to uh, leave our static type system to go to a loose like JSON representation of that type system. Send that JSON across the wire and then let whatever else like take that JSON and convert it back into uh, type system that we have over here. We can maintain our static Go type system all the way across, and we never we never depart from that. Uh, we're not marshalling and unmarshalling back and forth uh, to something that's more suitable for one purpose. We're just maintaining our types and we re regain a lot of time that way. Um, I can, I can um, it's maybe not advisable, I don't do this, but I can, uh, for very simple things, use my service, the types that are generated from my proto file that, that when I run the proto C command, it'll take my proto file and turn that into native Go types. I can use those as internal data types in my program. And just like that is everything that I'm gonna use type-wise is described in those files. Um, typically though, what you'll see is that like your, your data access layer will have 
uh, like a data domain that is specific and internal to a program. And we wind up like kind of kind of doing some conversion of like taking a internal uh, type like user and using the data in that type to populate a user response um, proto uh, proto buff type for sending. But it's but it's um, it's very simple and very straightforward. You know, I'm just copying fields out of one and into another. Um, typically, that is what you'll see in this, though it's not it's not absolutely necessary. Um, let's see. I want to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Uh, yeah, and actually, there's a couple questions. If you wanted to, uh, I don't know if now's a good time to. Yeah, get let's see. Uh, and I where can I? let's see. We state them if you don't see them. Yeah, because the hey, first thing. Somebody, I, yeah, Sunit. Sunit, hey, good to see you. I, I work with Sunit, and he found a um, he found a a repo that's got a bunch of Docker images that are used for for um, generating code from the proto buffs for all kinds of different all kinds of different platforms, right? And um, sometimes it can be a little tricky to make sure that you have all the tooling installed. Uh, but there, someone has been gracious enough to like put together Docker images that contain the tooling and you can do it that way. Um, that's a super cool tool. Thanks for pulling that out. Uh, let's see. I don't see any questions. Uh, they're actually in the, the Q and a section there. Uh, oh, 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 yeah. Let's yeah, see. They, they're, they've been upvoted too. So <laughs> let's see. I suggested protobuf to the mobile team at work and they are concerned about the difficulty to debug a binary protocol versus just using calling a RESTful API where they can see the raw JSON easily. What's the best way to debug gRPC and protobuf? That's a great question. And it always comes up. And the, the opposition or the, the concern that you expressed is one that is often like repeated. And it's always said like, oh no, I can't, I can't. The last time I gave this talk, someone like repeated over and over again, but you can't debug over the wire. I remember that expression, debug over the wire. That got said over and over again. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Like over the wire, what are you talking about? I don't like, I do not presently like debug over any wires. I mean, I'm, I'm dependent on, um, you know, looking, inspecting data is what I do when I debug, right? And um, so, so I can do that in like, um, for a RESTful service, I use PAW on my Mac as my HTTP client. The other people on my team use Postman. They're, they're, they're roughly the same thing, you know, where I can put in a URL, make a request, uh, get back a response, see the JSON. So in my, um, in my Go programs, what do I do for that? Like, I guess the, the simplest thing I could like, fumped.printf a string that is that contains the JSON that came back. And I can I can see the JSON there. But um but I can just as easily uh fumped.printf a uh percent plus v that contains a struct and and dump that and like turn that into a string that's like printed to my console. It's it's not like one of those isn't any easier or harder than the other. I do not need um, the data that I'm looking at to be a string in order to see it as a string and be able to read it as a string. So that's typically what happens is like you know I'm I've got a I've I've got a struct in my Go app that is the response body that's about to go out in this like gRPC handler function. And if I want to inspect that, uh, then I thumped.printf a formatted string with the percent plus V as the, as the format string and the struct as the data and boom, there's my, there's my log entry that has that. Uh, I don't know what, um, what the mobile team is using, but it's pretty simple to, it's pretty simple to do the conversion as part of my debugging process. Um, as soon it commented, full story here in Atlanta has published a kind of a UI around this. that's basically like Postman for gRPC services. You can give it a proto file and it will build um, the requests and uh, data, data types and build a uh, HTML UI around sending those things. So that's a way to do it too, but I wouldn't be too, 
I wouldn't be too scared away by that. Um, it it does add an extra step, but it's not a it's not a difficult or impossible step at all. Um, let's see, working with QA testers right now with Swagger, they can use Postman, Curl, or Swagger itself to test the endpoint. Hey, as Sunit mentioned, there's a there is a tool for doing this with um, with uh, Protos too. So no no concern. I mean, you you can absolutely do that. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. I'm going to have to check that out for sure. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Um, it's very kind of uh, of full story to have published that for everybody. Uh, here's here's the plant. Our Sabri is our uh, security expert, so he's bringing you this question now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, how do you deal? So, I'm going to take the you very personally and read that. Like, how do I deal with service? off with gRPC and the way that I do it is with um, is with uh, JWTs and um, those are there's it's very easy to it's as easy to do it with gRPC as it is to do it with um, with uh, a restful service my uh, my JWT is signed um, I can I can read that I can verify the signature. Uh, I issue, I know that I issued it to the person. And so I'll have like an endpoint that handles like login and exchanges credentials that they provide for a JWT that they can then use to make subsequent requests. Um, I can verify that JWT just as I would with a RESTful service. Um, and then having, I, I have the equivalent of middleware, HTTP middleware in my gRPC service. They're called unary service interceptors instead of being called middleware, but they're effectively the same thing. Um, and I can, I can write tooling around that fairly easily. I don't have any, I don't have any code that I can show you because it's all like work stuff that belongs to work. And I'm not quite prepared to like demo that, but it's, it's pretty straightforward and pretty easy. And if you get with me offline, I'm happy to like kind of show you around some of the things that I do around that. But it's, it's, um, it's very similar to the the thing that we already do with RESTful services. Yep, that makes sense to me. Uh, what do I? I'm at my I'm at my last slide. Uh, let's see. I don't know. I got to go back to the thing to to move it. Um, and here's what I want you to leave with. Like this is kind of the TLDR. You know my. My services are working harder than they have to. My developers are working harder than they have to. Uh, the API consumers are working harder than they have to. And that's a lot of latency just laying around ripe for the picking, right? That can be, that can be cut out of this whole process, uh, not just in application runtimes, but in product development cycles. And by removing this latency, I can regain a lot of performance that's been lost. Um, and, and gRPC is a fantastic tool for realizing gains there. Um, and that's it. I, I, uh, I've enjoyed being here and talking about it. I'm happy to answer any other questions or just chit chat with people or whatever, but, um, but that kind of concludes my talk and, um, I'm, I'm glad I got to give it to you. I hope that, I hope that this spurs you into going to reading more about it and kind of doing some discovery around this and, um, and building a uh, service of your own and kind of getting some hands-on time with this to check it out. Yeah, cool. I know, uh, yeah, with us, uh, <clears throat> where I'm at, we, we've been using instead of, uh, well, we've used protobufs in the past uh, for a lot of stuff. And then uh, we've been uh, using Avro, which seems to be kind of like the uh, preferred binary format for, uh, like using with uh, Kafka, um, but uh, looking to hopefully get into uh, gRPC for some of our uh, our edge to cloud kind of communication that we're having with some of these uh, some of these smart meters and such. So, you know, it's definitely uh, good timing on this talk. It's uh, yeah, I'm definitely wanting to get into it more. Let's see. It's like uh, we had another question come up. Yeah, it's it's the same question, and this is this is normal. Like if this is always like the oft repeated like question. Yeah, but but how do I see the? But how do I see the? I can't read the 
the, the, the packets, how do I see it? And um, that's always kind of a, that always comes up a lot. There, there is a tool for inspecting like request responses and, and playing with a, um, a gRPC service. There's, there's a tool that you could get installed on your machine pretty easily and, and, and do that um, if it's something that you need to do. But as a Go programmer, uh, you, you, don't, you don't in practice need to do that as, a, as, the, as the author of these services. You wind up, you're, you're not needing to do that. Um, but most of what we're looking for in JSON is how did my internal data get encoded? Because they're having hard, they're having a problem with it right now. How did that get encoded? What, let's go look at the JSON and see what's happening here. That's, that's usually like why we're going to look at it. And, um, with go with the protobuf implementation and go, you don't have to do that. It's like, it's just the native type. And if, and if you have a, a mental model of what your native types are, that's exactly what it is that your, that your, your, your proto, proto defined service is doing. It is just handling those native types. So a lot of the debugging that we're doing is becomes unnecessary. I have a question. It's, it's bait. I know it's bait, but kind of following <laughs> that, <laughs> following that question, um, because you, you sort of mentioned like you know the types sort of just work. Um, one of the things that I found with gRPC is that our error handling code just shrinks because it either either the message is valid or it isn't, right? And so you know when, when you're dealing with JSON. Um, even if you have some idea of the schema of what that that shape of that request should be, you still have to perform error handling to verify that all the fields are there, and you know all that great stuff. And you know things are typed the way that you expect them to, to be. Um, but if you're generating code based from the protobuf, based off of a protobuf, you don't necessarily have to perform that validation because it's strongly typed. So. Have you noticed any improvements from like stability or like uh, service stability or error handling, panic resistance, uh, resilience, things like that by switching to gRPC? Yeah, what your what your what you just said is exactly the truth. If I have a gRPC client consuming a gRPC service, because because they're both just using the same proto file that that IDL as the descriptor for how to generate a client and how to generate a server. So if I have a client that is generated for this server, then I know that they're gonna be compatible and that the type system in the client will be exactly compatible to the type system in this. They'll live in the same file. Um, the, the client and the server all live in the same file. So if I have that Go file that was generated for me, then boom, I've got a, I've got a client in that package that I can go like import into my, and I've just, I can just use the type, you're right. Uh, so there's a way of using this that's very common, though, where I, I also want a REST API that's an analog of my gRPC server, because I've got some, the web team with their JavaScript and the React, they don't want to use gRPC yet. They still want to do this the REST way, so they want a RESTful API. Um, can you deliver that? And yes, you can with just like, you know, five lines of code, you can say, oh, and hey, take this gRPC service and publish it as a, a RESTful API as well. And for each RPC that you define in your proto, you can throw a little option annotation in there that will show what the URL, what the, the REST URL ought to look like to hit that thing. And you give it a port. And now like, I've got gRPC running on port 9090 and, and REST is running on port 8080 and I can make REST requests to that thing. And in, in that case, when I'm doing it that way, I have now like, now I am no longer really like in gRPC land. I am now like, basically uh, I'm publishing a REST API the hard way is what I'm doing at that point, you know? Um, but some use cases demand it. Um, and in that case, then your HTTP client is still communicating JSON right? It knows nothing of the native types. And so you have to support that. And you tend to support that with like, um, with request validation, like you're describing. 
I wind up writing quite a bit of that, um, you know, kind of cursing under my breath as I do it because I realize how unnecessary it is and what a waste of time it is. That like, why are why are you even consuming this? Why don't you get the gRPC client, hit the service the 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 safe way? Um, but but not all use cases support that. So so yes. Had another one come up. Uh, I'm kind of pretty uh, curious about this as well. But uh, how about uh, version handling with the uh, services? Oh, uh, that's that's on that's on us. Like it's up to me to uh, to still. You mean it won't do it for me. It won't do it for you. We we still have to sensibly version our APIs. Yeah, and if we publish backwards backwards incompatible changes, we will break things yeah. for people. Um, yeah, but everything everything we know about uh, about that is applicable to this too. It's like this doesn't really change that. Like all all of my best practices, best engineering practices around API versioning still apply here. Yeah, cool. Another one. Uh, somebody talked to their friends uh, about. I guess AWS was having issues with gRPC going through their load balancers. Um, have you ever heard about that? Know any? That's still an issue. I would imagine it's probably the with uh, dealing with HTTP two might have been the issue. Yeah, I don't know much about that. I'm I'm not the most SRE shaped guy in the room for sure. So <laughs> uh, I I don't know. Uh, the stuff that we're doing is on on Google Cloud, um, and I'm not sure how. I'm not sure if AWS is a hit or a miss on this. I I can't imagine that they would just be like a straight miss on this and like you can't do it. Yeah, I know. I know for us uh, with one of our projects, I'm not too involved with it, but I know that uh, yeah, there were some issues just with uh, supporting HTTP two from some of our edge services. So unfortunately, so we yeah haven't been able to really get into gRPC quite just yet. I just I just did a quick Google search, and on November seventh of twenty nineteen, there's a press release that says AWS App Mesh now supports HTTP two and gRPC services. Um, so they are at least moving in that direction. Uh, here's another article that says how to create load balancer for gRPC on AWS. Yeah, I was going to to, to add that you know you don't need to run gRPC over HTTP at all. Um, and in a lot of cases for like service to service communication, you may not want to use HTTP. Um, it, wor it works just fine over the wire, over TCP. Um, but you don't, you lose some of the TCP, you lose some of the HTTP functionality if you run it over TCP. Um, I've ran gRPC over UDP and it works just fine. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but uh, the protobuf in it's a streaming format, it'll work. Um, so for like, uh, I know there's considerations about using it in embedded space um, where they don't necessarily want a full HTTP or TCP stack. Um, and it, it's working pretty well there. It's kind of nice if you can uh, handle lossy communication potentially. Yeah. I mean, and it's great because, you know, it goes back to the, the message formatting. It either parses completely or it doesn't at mm -hmm. all. So replay becomes very, very easy. I didn't understand that. Please send. Right, you don't have to figure out like you know partial messaging and stuff like that. Another question uh, came through: uh, Any performance degradations of gRPC published as REST? Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. You lose all the performance gains that I just talked about in this talk, like literally all of them. Um, I think this is dumb. If you want a RESTful service, build a RESTful service. Uh, literally, that's kind of what I think about it. Like, it's not a, this is the dumb, this is a dumb way to build a RESTful web service. It's, it's much easier and more straightforward just to build like, to build that the way that we already do it than to, to try to uh, wrap it around a gRPC service. Cool. I have another question, um, if no one else has a question. Um, for one of the things that you know, I ran into when I was first starting to use gRPC over REST is that um, a lot of services aren't designed to work in an asynchronous way. Um, gRPC is like inherently sort of asynchronous and it's a stream. Um, 
did you did you find that um, developing services to handle gRPC internally from like a, just a service loop was more difficult than HTTP? Um, or was there like just a natural sort of transition? I haven't run into that yet. Uh, oh, I should have included in the preface to this. I'm not an expert on anything. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just a guy who does this stuff every day and like and in doing it has learned some things. Um, I, I haven't run into that. I've, I've kind of treated it very much like the same way that I would um, any other API. I'm just writing functions that will be made available to the consumers over over a network instead of in local call space is all that's the that's all this is right um and so i the the asynchronicity or whatever hasn't been a hasn't been in i mean i haven't seen that be an issue but then i maybe that's just being a sensible programmer and like writing things um you know, to eliminate race conditions. Like what if I, what if I'm, I get two updates to the same thing at the same time, which one wins, you know? And like, we, we, we do some defensive programming around that kind of thing, but we're doing that already. I mean, that's not like, that's not unique to this space. Oh, what's one of the more fun or advanced features of gRPC that I have found useful? Um, God, there's a, there's, let me see if I can find a repo. There's a, uh, validator for a request validator uh -oh, for, for that's built into the protos themselves so that uh let's see that's it um this is pretty cool this lets me add some annotations to my proto definition of the service where i describe how the validation for fields ought to work and by doing that, um, when I run the when I run the command to generate the code that will that will be generated from my proto file, uh, validators for each of the message types are also generated and can be used in my program. Um, this is this is pretty handy. I mean, like this this takes a lot of like um, this takes a lot of work off of my shoulders by like automating something that I otherwise would have to do. It's pretty cool. Um, uh, but then it turns out that like the little functions that you need to do this are very easy to write anyway. So it's not like it turns out to it's I don't know, maybe it seems like a bigger deal than it actually is. Is it normal to be absolutely lost when first learning RPC? Yeah, I think it's normal to be absolutely lost when first learning pretty much anything. Um, the examples at grpc.io are really uh, are really easy to follow. I mean, you can you can pull that repo down and get it running, and kind of observe and watch. and And it's pretty it's pretty simple. And they give they do like the minimal example necessary to make something work and show you. So I would encourage you to just pull pull that repo and run it locally and and watch it like uh, watch it work and make some make some little changes to it and watch that work and and um, and after getting some experience with it, it, it definitely gets easier, kind of kind of like everything else we do. Is gRPC just Corba made async? Uh, I don't know. I'm going to let somebody older than me answer that question. I'm not taking that one. <laughs> I never did Corba. I just... I just made fun of the book. I just remember writing EJBs and all that stuff and seeing Corba in there and RMI and all that. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Not good. It's it is it is it is an evolutionary step in the remote procedure call thing that has been being done in one way or another for 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 45 years. I mean like it's not a it is conceptually similar to other things that have been done, sure. Um, I think it's very modern and very different than anything that has been done before, too, and like very uh, refined and solves a lot of the problems that we have run into in the past. Oh, Sabri's on the hook here. Question about UDP. What did I do? 
<laughs> when you said you've used this on uh, UDP, <laughs> did you mean protobuf or gRPC since gRPC uses HTTP2? That's complicated. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, hmm. I'm, I'm trying to think very carefully of how to answer this. So gRPC uses HTTP2, but... Um, there are no, it's fine because it's, it's, it's a really good question, <laughs> actually. Um, but there have been some open issues around using it under on unreliable transport. Um, and effectively, what you end up doing is you end up implementing just the part of gRPC that you want or need for your application, um, over UDP or TCP. Um, and it works pretty well, actually. Um, but we were also not using the gRPC libraries that Google provides. Um, we were in Rust. So all of the gRPC libraries that we were using were written specifically for that sort of thing. Um, so uh, that's one of the case. Another case where the language support, um, there are some discrepancies. Um, we've actually found some gRPC bugs um, in the Java library um, that prevented some of the communication over the transport layer that we were looking for. Um, there's, I will link to this if you are curious about this stuff um, and some of the pitfalls that you'll run into if you do try to run it over UAP. Uh, uh, that's all. Cool. All right. I think, uh, all right. Well, anybody else? Otherwise, I think uh, we had quite a bit of interaction here tonight. All right, let me uh, switch back to my slides. All right, there we go. Okay. Now we're cooking with gas again. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was really a good talk. Uh, really appreciate that, John. Um, and Sabri for uh, jumping in there for uh, some of the UDP questions. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so... Um, Please do give us uh, any kind of feedback, good, bad, indifferent, uh, you know, uh, thoughts for and ideas for any future sessions. Um, we're going to be, uh, as you'll see here, well, here, wait, let's just go through the slides. Um, so don't social distance alone. You know, we had the uh, the St. Louis Tech Slack. I was talking with John and I know that uh, Atlanta has a similar type of uh, Slack uh, Go channel going. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, all the other folks, and Steve just asked, are these recorded? Yes, they are recorded, and they'll be available at the same URL that you just uh, used to uh, join join the talk. Um, and now, Sabri, being our, uh, our CNCF ambassador, uh, has been able to hook us up with a couple uh, – Couple gift cards for uh, the swag shop at CNCF. So, what I'm going to do is uh, worked out pretty well last time, but uh, I have a list of all the people who are currently online. So you got to be in attendance. So don't don't shut off. Um, I'm going to use the random number generator here. All right, so between 1 and the 18, so whoever is player number 16, um, player number 16, let me take a look here. That is uh, Siva Seredu, and I'm sure I butchered the pronunciation. I apologize. <laughs> so, yeah, so we got your information there. So, uh, yeah, if you can hook us up with... Uh, you know, Twitter, email, whatever, and then uh, Sabri can get with you to uh, get that certificate for you. Um, and now let me go ahead and generate the next winner. 
okay, that's something's up with that. They didn't use secure random or something because, I mean, it just came up with 16 again. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So who's, who's player number eight here? Two, four, six, eight. Okay. There's, there's shenanigans on this screen. Here we go. Let me start from the top. Maybe that works better. Two, four, six. Rudy. Okay, so Rudy, whoever uh, you answered the or asked one of the first questions, actually. Um, yeah, so please don't drop off. If you would, uh, just kind of uh, either put in the chat so your full name or something so we can try to get a hold of you afterwards. Or, uh, or else if you want to... Uh, um, you can DM me on uh, Twitter or something like that. And then, okay, there you go. Cool. That'll work. That way then Sabri can get those out to you. Um, it's it's uh, definitely nice that we have uh, some kind of giveaways. Um, so thanks to the CNCF for that. Uh, and now, there we go. Okay, so now what I was going to get into before is that we're not going to have a uh, session next month for July. We're we're going to take a little bit of a hiatus, a uh, little summer vacation, um, get Sabri off the hook, you know, because we've been we've been utilizing him for a lot of talks and that. So give him some time to rest and recover. So <laughs> and so that makes it that uh, August twenty sixth will be our next session. Um, I'm guessing that'll probably be again on Crowdcast. I can't imagine that uh, our normal venue will be open just yet for us to meet live. I don't know, sees you maybe uh, you'll have uh, you'll hear differently, and then uh, but regardless, though, we found that uh, you know, we're expanding our region here, and then uh, people are kind of interested in some of the stuff that we've been having, so. Um, regardless, even if we would do this live and in person, we'll still have a uh, streaming aspect. So, so we'll get that, we'll get that kind of stuff set up. So we don't know yet, but uh, just be sure to follow us on the STL Go Meetup on Twitter um, or just uh, on the Meetup. I'll try to put out information as things come up. Um, we don't have anything lined up for August just yet. Uh, Sabri and I were talking about uh, one of the next talks be maybe about uh, um, with the news about uh, VS Code or the uh, I guess it's the Go plugin really for VS Code is uh, was contributed to the GoLang uh, group um, that we would talk a little bit more about that stuff because I know I'm personally I've been using GoLand but uh, from JetBrains uh, but uh, you know that's a a paid product and then. Uh, you know, VS Code seems to be seems to be pretty sweet. I use it for a lot of other things, but I haven't done it for uh, doing actual Go development yet. So, um, so we'll we'll probably talk a lot on that kind of stuff, and then maybe whatever else might be coming up. So, hopefully, uh, we will see many of you if we're lucky in person. Otherwise, uh, virtually. And then, uh, thank you, and uh, we'll look forward to the next one. So, John. Again, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, and uh, we'll talk to you all later. Thank you. Thanks Stay safe and healthy. Thanks. Bye-bye.